Hindu cosmology talks about multiple worlds, many planes of existence called Lokas. They are classified into higher and lower realms of existence. When one thinks of the lower planes of existence, one thinks about hellish landscapes where the residents are subject to eternal torment. But is that an accurate portrayal? What really happens in the lower realms of existence according to Hindu cosmology? Are they allegories from which we can learn something? Before we jump in, I'd like to clarify two important points. Vedanta, much like the tenets of ancient wisdom which we discuss here, considers most of these spheres of existence to be temporary and illusory. The only reality is the Supreme Absolute or what we call the God Energy. Remember also that the Puranas, which is the source material for this video, are heavily bhakti oriented texts. They do talk about Vedantic concepts, but there's a heavy devotional component to it. When people talk about Hindu cosmology, people usually talk about 14 worlds, lokas, divided into seven higher realms and seven lower subterranean realms of existence. Before we look at this, an interesting fact is that the Puranic texts actually talk about a host of other worlds, not just the 14. For example, the Siva Purana talks about the 14 worlds comprising our universe as being Brahma's worlds manifested by the creative power. The Siva Purana then goes on to talk about 14 worlds dedicated to Vishnu above these 14 worlds and then another 28 worlds beyond those 14. It then talks about the pure world of Shiva that exists beyond these 56 worlds. As fascinating as that is, we will discuss that for another day. Coming back to the 14 worlds that comprise our universe. According to the Siva Purana, the 14 worlds comprising our universe are created by Brahma, the creative power. The lower worlds are seven and the upper worlds are also seven in number. The seven higher realms start from Bhuloka, the earth, and move up to Satyaloka, which is the abode of the creator god Brahma. These worlds are inhabited by saints and other realized beings, according to the Puranas. What is really interesting is what happens in the lower worlds, the lower planes of existence, according to some of these texts. Let us take a look at two Puranic texts, the Shiva Purana and the Bhagavata Purana to see the description of these lower worlds of existence. According to the Shiva Purana, the seven nether worlds, the lower worlds, the subterranean worlds are Athala, Vithala, Sutala, Rasathala, Thala, Talathala and the Pathala Loka. The Siva Purana describes the nether worlds in this way. The surfaces of all are grounds of gems, the palaces are full of gems and their terraces are made of gold. Narada, a saint who came to heaven from the nether region, announced in the middle of the celestial assembly that the nether worlds are more beautiful than heaven. He says, There all sorts of ornaments, lustrous jewels are present. They are delightful. What is there equal to it? He continues, The nether region is here and there brightened up by the daughters of the Daityas and the Dhanavas. Even to the liberated soul, the nether region is pleasing. Which liberated soul does not like it? He goes on to say, There, during the daytime, there are no sun's rays, nor the moon's rays during the night. There is neither cold nor bright sunlight. There is only the luster of the jewels. All sorts of foodstuffs and drinks are consumed there by extremely joyous persons. The time that passes by is not known there at all. Contrary to endless pain and suffering, these worlds seem to be a heaven for those concerned with the material. The Bhagavata Purana, another ancient text, in fact calls these lower seven lokas Bilaswarga or subterranean heavens. A quick detour and people probably are wondering about this as well. A few verses did touch upon the beings that are described in these regions, Daityas, Dhanavas and so on and so forth. We will take a look at what these symbolize in a later video, but for now it's essential to understand that all these beings, uh, Devas, Daityas, Dhanavas, Asuras, etc. that we encountered in all these books are actually sibling races. All these are sibling races, descendants of the daughters of Daksa, who was the created son of Brahma, the creative energy. The Siva Purana actually says this, 
Devas, sages, demons, trees, birds and mountain creepers, all born of the daughters of Daksa, fill the entire space between the Pathala Loka to the Satya Loka, which is the 14 worlds. Every sentient being, Deva or Asura, has a potential for good and evil, Dharma and Adharma, which we will discuss later. Coming back to the Bhagavata Purana, the Bhagavata Purana calls out the seven Saturnian regions as Atala, Vithala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala and Patala. The ordering is slightly changed from that of the Siva Purana. The regions again are described as veritable heavens. It says, therein reside Daityas, Dhanavas and serpents in extremely rich mansions, gardens, parks and playgrounds which surpass the heavenly world in their exuberance of sensuous enjoyments, affluence, joy and riches. They are householders whose affectionate wives, children, relatives always enjoy a delightful life. Their desires are never thwarted. They divert themselves with their skills in Maya, which is the art of creating illusions. It then goes on to say that Maya, the architect of miraculous powers, has built cities in these regions. They shine resplendent with wonderful mansions, gates, town halls, temples, big quadrangles and houses constructed with excellent precious stones of various types. Like the Shiva Purana, the Bhagavata Purana also talks about the gardens that exceed the splendor of those in the land of gods with their glorious beauty giving delight to mind and senses. The Bhagavata Purana says, It is said that here in this netherworld no fear is noticed due to the divisions of time such as day and night. The crest jewels in the hoods of the great serpents dispel all the darkness here. In terms of the conditions of the inhabitants of this world, the Bhagavata Purana has this to say. Due to the intake of herbs, elixir, food, drinks and bath of miraculous efficiencies, the inhabitants of these regions do not suffer from mental worries or physical ailments. They are immune from wrinkles, grey hair and old age. Nor are they affected by bodily changes due to age, from childhood to old age. So, these are the descriptions of the seven lower realms of existence in the Hindu cosmology. They seem pretty heavenly according to our current conditioning. Now, what do we make out of this? What are they allegories for? Why are the lower realms of existence so much more spectacular than the higher realms of existence? If we look at the Lokas from the perspective of collective consciousness, we arrive at a fascinating conclusion. The ancient wisdom states that we are all deluded by the illusion of the material world, Maya. There is an internal conflict between the part of us that is attracted to the material world and the part of us that yearns for liberation. If you look at the conflict, we arrive at a conclusion. The lower worlds depict a shift towards more materialism. As you move to the lower planes of existence, you shift more towards materialism and get trapped by it. They truly are subterranean heavens for the materially inclined. However, the more one gets ensnared in the material world, the more one gets deluded by Maya and the more difficult it is to break out and attain liberation. Who is not tempted at the prospect of a relatively eternal life that you can spend with your loved ones without fear of death or disease? Who can cast that off for the search of the ultimate truth? Guarantee of spending relative eternity with loved ones in paradise free of any concerns is the concept of heaven as we know it. However, that heaven would seem temporary to the seeker. A seeker would question that too, since that is not the ultimate answer. Questions would arise, why is this happening? What is the creative force behind this? Above all, to a true seeker, this also gets limiting. The concept of a heaven is also extremely limiting. And the true seeker, in all likelihood, would get bored real quick. The conversation in the Kathopanishad comes to mind. The exchanges between Nachiketa, a young boy, and Yama, the god of death. Nachiketa asks Yama as one of the boons to explain what happens to the soul when it finally leaves the physical world. 
Nachiketa is not talking about the intermediate death in the cycle of birth and death. He knows that because he's dead and talking to Yama. Nachiketa asks about liberation. Yama implores Nachiketa not to ask this question. He promises him great wealth, vast kingdoms, immortal progenies, and many other material pleasures. Nachiketa responds by saying that the joys felt in the material world are illusory and imagined. They arise from objects which are falsely considered the source of joy. Nachiketa refuses all this wealth and power, declaring that the ultimate truth is what he seeks. Then Yama accedes that Nachiketa is a true seeker and he talks about the ultimate reality. And the realization of the oneness with the self, the Atman, with the Brahman, or the Supreme Absolute, or the Oversoul, or the God Energy, or whatever you call it. He concludes that in finality, on realizing the essential unity of being, having known the Supreme Absolute, one becomes the self of all beings. With this, I end my thoughts on the description of the netherworlds in the Dharmic cosmology, specifically Hindu cosmology. I believe that even though the subterranean realms are veritable heavens, what's being reiterated here is that the material world is illusory. The self is verily a part of the ultimate reality. An attachment to the material plane is actually detrimental in the path towards realization. As always, the known is a drop and the unknown is an ocean. Peace.